Part 2. The Revelation of the Bab. Chapter 3. The Declaration of the Bab's Mission. The death of Seed Kazim was the signal for renewed activity on the part of his enemies. The thirst for leadership and emboldened by his removal and the consequent dismay of his followers, they reasserted their claims and prepared to realize their ambitions. For a time, fear and anxiety filled the hearts of Seed Kazim's faithful disciples, but with the return of Mullah Husseini Bushrui from the highly successful mission with which he had been entrusted by his teacher, their gloom was dispelled. It was on the first day of Muharram in the year A.H. 1260, 22nd of January, A.D. 1844, that Mullah Hussein came back to Kabila. He cheered and strengthened the disconsolate disciples of his beloved chief, reminded them of his unfailing promise, and pleaded for unrelaxing vigilance and unremitting effort in their search for the concealed beloved. Living in the close neighbourhood of the house the seer had occupied, he, for three days, was engaged continually in receiving visits from a considerable number of mourners who hastened to convey to him, as the leading representative of the seer's disciples, the expression of their distress and sorrow. He afterwards summoned a group of his most distinguished and trusted fellow disciples and inquired about the expressed wishes and the last exhortations of their departed leader. They told him that, repeatedly and emphatically, Seed Kazim had bidden them quit their homes, scatter far and wide, purge their hearts from every idle desire, and dedicate themselves to the quest of him to whose advent he had so often alluded. He told us, they said, that the object of our quest was now revealed. The veils that intervened between you and him are such as only you can remove by your devoted search. Nothing short of prayerful endeavour, of purity of motive, of singleness of mind, will, will enable you to tear them asunder. Has not God revealed in his book, Whoso maketh efforts for us, in our ways will we guide them? Quran 29.69 Why then, Mullah Hussein observed, have you chosen to tarry in Kalbila? Why is it that you have not dispersed and arisen to carry out his earnest plea? We acknowledge our failure, was their reply. To your greatness we all bear witness. Such is our confidence in you, that if you claim to be the promised one, we shall all readily and unquestionably submit. We herein pledge our loyalty and obedience to, to whatever you bid us perform. God forbid, exclaimed Mullah Hussein, far be it from his glory that I, who am but dust, should be compared to him who is the Lord of Lords. Had you been conversant with the tone and language of Seed Kazim, you never would have uttered such words. Your first obligation, as well as mine, is to arise and carry out, both in the spirit and in the letter, the dying message of our beloved chief. He rose instantly from his seat and went directly to Mirza Hassan i Gohar, Mirza Muhit, and other well-known figures among the disciples of Seed Kazim. To each and all, he fearlessly delivered the parting message of his chief, emphasizing the pressing character of their duty and urged them to arise and fulfill it. To his plea they returned evasive and unworthy answers. Our enemies, one of them remarked, are many and powerful. We must remain in this city and guard the vacant seat of our departed chief. Another observed, It is incumbent upon me to stay and care for the children whom the seer has left behind. Mullah Hussein immediately recognized the futility of his efforts. Realizing the degree of their folly and blindness and ingratitude, he spoke to them no more. He retired leaving them to their idle pursuits. As the year 1260, the year that witnessed the birth of the promised revelation, had just dawned upon the world, it would not seem inappropriate at this juncture to, di to digress from our theme and to mention certain traditions of Muhammad and of the imams of the faith which bear specific reference to that year. Imam Jafar, son of Muhammad, when questioned concerning the year in which the Qayyim was to be made manifest, replied as follows, Verily, in the year 1260 his cause shall be revealed, and his name shall be noised abroad. In the works of the learned and far-famed din i arabi many references are to be found regarding both the year of the advent and the name of the promised manifestation. Among them are the following. The ministers and upholders of his faith shall be of the people of Persia. 
In his name, the name of the guardian, Ali, precedeth that of the prophet, Muhammad. The year of his revelation is identical with half of that number which is divisible by nine, 2,520. Mirza Muhammad i Akhbari, in his poems relating to the year of the manifestation, makes the following prediction. In the year Ghaz, the numerical value of the letters of which is 1260, the earth shall be illumined by his light, and in Qarasi, 1265, the world shall be suffused with its glory. If, if thou livest until the year Garasi, 1270, thou shalt witness how the nations, the rulers, the peoples, and the faith of God shall all have been renewed. In a tradition ascribed to the Imam Ali, the commander of the faithful, it is likewise recorded, in Gaz the tree of divine guidance shall be planted. Mullah Hussein Having acquitted himself of the obligation he felt to urge and awaken his fellow disciples, set out from Kabila for Najaf. With him were Muhammad Hassan, his brother, and Muhammad Bakir, his nephew, both of whom had accompanied him ever since his visit to his native town of Bushrui in the province of Khurasan. Arriving at the Mashid i Kufi, Mullah Hussein decided to spend forty days in that place where he led a life of retirement and prayer. By his fasts and vigils, he prepared himself for the holy adventure upon which he was soon to embark. In the exercise of these acts of worship, his brother alone was associated with him, while his nephew, who attended to their daily needs, observed the fasts, and at the hours of leisure joined them in their devotion. This cloistered calm with which they were surrounded was, after a few days, unexpectedly interrupted by the arrival of Mullah Ali i Bastami, one of the foremost disciples of Sayyid Kazim. He, together with twelve other companions, arrived at the Majid i Kufi, where he found his fellow disciple, Mullah Hussein, immersed in contemplation and prayer. Mullah Ali was endowed with such vast learning and was so deeply conversant with the teachings of Sheikh Ahmad that many regarded him as even superior to Mullah Hussein. On several occasions he attempted to inquire from Mullah Hussein as to his destination after the termination of the period of his retirement. Every time he approached him he found him so wrapped in his devotions that he felt it impossible to venture a question. He soon decided to retire like him for forty days from the society of men. All his companions followed his example, with the exception of three who acted as their personal attendants. Immediately after the completion of his forty days' retirement, Mullah Hussein, together with his two companions, departed for Najaf. He left Kabila by night, visited on his way the shrine of Najaf, and proceeded directly to Bushir, in the Persian Gulf. There he started on his holy quest, after the beloved of his heart's desire. There, for the first time, inhale the fragrance of him who, for years, had led in that city the life of a merchant and humble citizen. There he perceived the sweet savours of holiness with which that beloved's countless invocations had so richly impregnated the atmosphere of that city. He could not, however, tarry longer in Bushir, Drawn as if by a magnet which seemed to attract him irresistibly towards the north, he proceeded to Shiraz. Arriving at the gate of that city, he instructed his brother and his nephew to proceed directly to the Majid i Ilkhani, and there to remain until his arrival. He expressed the hope that, God willing, he would arrive in time to join them in their evening prayer. On that very day, a few hours before sunset, whilst walking outside the gate of the city, his eyes fell suddenly upon a youth of radiant countenance, who wore a green turban and who, advancing towards him, greeted him with a smile of loving welcome. He embraced Mullah Hussein with tender affection, as though he had been his intimate and lifelong friend. Mullah Hussein thought him at first to be a disciple of Seed Qazim, who, on being informed of his approach to Shiraz, had come out to welcome him. 
Mirza Ahmadi Khazvini, the martyr who on several occasions had heard Mullah Hussein recount to the early believers the story of his moving and historic interview with the Bab, related to me the following. I have heard Mullah Hussein repeatedly and graphically describe the circumstances of that remarkable interview. The youth who met me outside the gate of Shiraz overwhelmed me with expressions of affection and loving kindness. He extended to me a warm invitation to visit his home and there refresh myself after the fatigues of my journey. I pray to be excused, pleading that my two companions had already arranged for my stay in that city and were now awaiting my return. Commit them to the care of God, was his reply. He will surely protect and watch over them. Having spoken these words, he bade me follow him. I was profoundly impressed by the gentle yet compelling manner in which that strange youth spoke to me. As I followed him, his gait, the charm of his voice, the dignity of his bearing, served to enhance my first impressions of this unexpected meeting. We soon found ourselves standing at the gate of a house of modest appearance. He knocked at the door, which was soon opened by an Ethiopian servant. Enter therein in peace, secure, Quran 1546, were his words as he crossed the threshold and motioned me to follow him. His invitation, uttered with power and majesty, penetrated my soul. I thought it a good augury to be addressed in such words, standing as I did on the threshold of the first house I was entering in Shiraz, a city the very atmosphere of which had produced already an indescribable impression upon me. Might not my visit to this house, I thought to myself, enable me to draw nearer to the object of my quest? Might it not hasten the termination of a period of intense longing, of strenuous search, of increasing anxiety, which such a quest involves? As I entered the house and followed my host to his chamber, a feeling of unutterable joy invaded my being. Immediately we were seated. He ordered a ewer of water to be brought and bade me wash away from my hands and feet the stains of travel. I pleaded permission to retire from his presence and perform my ablutions in an adjoining room. He refused to grant my request and proceeded to pour the water over my hands. He then gave me to drink of a refreshing beverage, after which he asked for the samovar and himself prepared the tea which he offered me. Overwhelmed with his acts of extreme kindness, I rose to depart. The time for evening prayer is approaching, I ventured to observe. I have promised my friends to join them at the hour in the Mashiri Yochani. With extreme courtesy and calm, he replied, You must surely have made the hour of your return conditional upon the will and pleasure of God. It seems that his will has decreed otherwise. You need have no fear of having broken your pledge. His dignity and self-assurance silenced me. I renewed my ablutions and prepared for prayer. He too stood beside me and prayed. Whilst praying, I unburdened my soul, which was much oppressed, both by the mystery of this interview and the strain and stress of my search. I breathed this prayer. I have striven with all my soul, O oh my God, and until now have failed to find thy promised messenger. I testify that thy word faileth not, and that thy promise is sure. That night, that memorable night, was the eve preceding the fifth day of Jamadiul Aval in the year A.H. 1260, a footnote says, corresponding with the evening of the 22nd of May, A.D. 1844, 23rd of May, fell on a Thursday. It was about an hour after sunset when my youthful host began to converse with me. Whom, after Syed Qazim, he asked me, do you regard as his successor and your leader? At the hour of his death, I replied, our departed teacher insistently exhorted us to forsake our homes, to scatter far and wide in quest of the promised beloved. I have accordingly journeyed to Persia, have arisen to accomplish his will. And I'm still engaged in my quest. Has your teacher, he further inquired, given you any detailed indications 
as to the distinguishing features of the promised one. Yes, I replied, he is of pure lineage, is of illustrious descent, and of the seed of Fatimi. As to his age, he is more than twenty and less than thirty. He is endowed with innate knowledge. He is of medium height, abstains from smoking, and is free from bodily deficiency. He paused for a while, and then with vibrant voice declared, Behold, all these signs are manifest in me. He then considered each of the above-mentioned signs separately and conclusively demonstrated that each and all were applicable to his person. I, I was greatly surprised and politely observed, He whose advent we await is a man of unsurpassed holiness, and the cause he is to reveal a cause of tremendous power. Many and diverse are the requirements which he who claims to be its visible embodiment must needs fulfill. How often has Seed Kazim referred to the vastness of the knowledge of the Promised One? How often did he say, My own knowledge is but a drop compared with that with which he has been endowed? All my attainments are but a speck of dust in the face of the immensity of his knowledge. Nay, immeasurable is the difference. No sooner had these words dropped from my lips than I found myself seized with fear and remorse, such as I could neither conceal nor explain. I bitterly reproved myself and resolved at that very moment to alter my attitude and to soften my tone. I vowed to God that should my host again refer to the subject, I would, with the utmost humility, answer and say, if you be willing to substantiate your claim, you will most assuredly deliver me from the anxiety and suspense which so heavily oppresses my soul. I shall truly be indebted to you for such deliverance. When I first started upon my quest, I determined to regard the two following standards as those whereby I could ascertain the truth of whosoever might claim to be the promised Qayyim. The first was a treatise which I had myself composed bearing upon the abstruse and hidden teachings propounded by Sheikh Ahmad and Seed Qazim. Whoever seemed to me capable of unravelling the mysterious illusions made in that treatise, to him I would next submit my second request, and would ask him to reveal, without the least hesitation or reflection, a commentary on the Suri of Joseph, in a style and language entirely different from the prevailing standards of the time. I had previously requested Seed Qazim in private to write a commentary on that same Suri, which he refused, saying, This is verily beyond me. He, that great one who comes after me, will, unasked, reveal it for you. That commentary will constitute one of the weightiest testimonies of his truth, and one of the clearest evidences of the loftiness of his position. I was resolving these things in my mind when my distinguished host again remarked, Observe attentively. Might not the person intended by Seed Kazim be none other than I? I thereupon felt impelled to present to him a copy of the treatise which I had with me. Will you, I asked him, read this book of mine and look at its pages with indulgent eyes? I pray you to overlook my weakness and failings. He graciously complied with my wish. He opened the book, glanced at certain passages, closed it, and began to address me. Within a few minutes he had, with characteristic vigour and charm, unravelled all its mysteries and resolved all its problems. Having to my entire satisfaction accomplished within so short a time the task I had expected him to perform, he further expounded to me certain truths which could be found neither in the reported sayings of the Imams of the Faith nor in the writings of Sheikh Ahmad and Seyyid Kazim. These truths, which I had never heard before, seemed to be endowed with refreshing vividness and power. Had you not been my guest, he afterwards observed, your position would indeed have been a grievous one. The all-encompassing grace of God has saved you. It is for God to test his servants and not for his servants to judge him in accordance with their deficient standards. Were I to fail to resolve your perplexities, could the reality that shines within me be regarded as powerless, or my knowledge be accused as faulty? Nay, by the righteousness of God, 
it behoves in this day the peoples and nations of both the East and the West to hasten to this threshold and here seek to obtain the reviving grace of the merciful. Whoso hesitates will indeed be in grievous loss. Do not the peoples of the earth testify that the fundamental purpose of their creation is the knowledge and adoration of God? It behoves them to arise as earnestly and spontaneously as you have arisen, and to seek with determination and constancy their promised beloved. He then proceeded to say, Now is the time to reveal the commentary on the Suri of Joseph. He took up his pen, and with incredible rapidity, revealed the entire Suri of Mulk, the first chapter of his commentary on the Suri of Joseph. The overpowering effect of the manner in which he wrote was heightened by the gentle intonation of his voice which accompanied his writing. Not for one moment did he interrupt the flow of the verses which streamed from his pen, not once did he pause till the Suri of Mulk was finished. I sat enraptured by the magic of his voice and the sweeping force of his revelation. At last I reluctantly arose from my seat and begged leave to depart smilingly bade me be seated and said, If you leave in such a state, whoever sees you will assuredly say, This poor youth has lost his mind. At that moment, the clock registered two hours and eleven minutes after sunset. That night, the eve of the fifth day of Jamadiul Abal in the year A.H. 1260, corresponded with the eve preceding the sixty-fifth day after Nauru's which was also the eve of the sixth day of Kurdad of the year Nahang. This night, he declared, this very hour will in the days to come be celebrated as one of the greatest and most significant of all festivals. Render thanks to God for having graciously assisted you to attain your heart's desire and for having quaffed from the sealed wine of his utterance. Well is it with them that attain thereunto. At the third hour after sunset, my host ordered the dinner to be served. That same Ethiopian servant appeared again and spread before us the choicest food. That holy repast refreshed alike my body and soul. In the presence of my host at that hour, I felt as though I were feeding upon the fruits of paradise. I could not but marvel at the manners and the devoted attentions of that Ethiopian servant, whose very life seemed to have been transformed by the regenerating influence of his master. I then, for the first time, recognized the significance of this well-known traditional utterance ascribed to Mohammed. I have prepared for the godly and righteous among my servants what I have seen not, ear heard not, nor human heart conceived. Had my youthful host no other claim to greatness, this was sufficient, that he received me with that quality of hospitality and loving kindness, which I was convinced no other human being could possibly reveal. I sat spellbound by his utterance, oblivious of time and of those who awaited me. Suddenly the call of the Muazim, summoning the faithful to their morning prayer, awakened me from the state of ecstasy into which I seemed to have fallen. All the delights, all the ineffable glories, which the Almighty has recounted in his book as the priceless possessions of the people of paradise, these I seem to be experiencing that night. Methinks I was in a place of which it could truly be said, therein no toil shall reach us, and therein no weariness shall touch us. No vain discourse shall they hear therein, nor any falsehood, but only the cry, Peace peace. Their cry therein shall be, Glory be to thee, O God, and their salutation therein, peace. And the close of their cry, Praise be to God, Lord of all creatures. Quotations from the Quran. Sleep had departed from me that night. I was enthralled by the music of that voice which rose and fell as he chanted. Now swelling forth as he revealed verses of the Qayyumul Azma, the above commentary on the story of Joseph, again acquiring ethereal, subtle harmonies 
as he uttered the prayers he was revealing. At the end of each invocation, he would repeat this verse, Far from the glory of thy Lord, the all-glorious, be that which his creatures affirm of him. And peace be upon his messengers, and praise be to God, the Lord of all beings. Quran 37, 180. He then addressed me in these words, O thou who art the first to believe in me, verily I say, I am the Bab, the gate of God, and thou art the Babul Bab, the gate of the gate. Eighteen souls must, in the beginning, spontaneously and of their own accord, accept me and recognize the truth of my revelation. Unwarned and uninvited, each of these must seek independently to find me. And when their number is complete, one of them must needs be chosen to accompany me on my pilgrimage to Mecca and Medina. There I shall deliver the message of God to the Sharif of Mecca. I then shall return to Kufi, where again, in the Majid of that holy city, I shall manifest his cause. It is incumbent upon you not to divulge either to your companions or to any other soul that which you have seen and heard. Be engaged in the majid i khani in prayer and in teaching. I too will there join you in congregational prayer. Beware lest your attitude toward me betray the secret of your faith. You should continue in this occupation and maintain this attitude until our departure for Hijaz. Ere we depart, we shall appoint unto each of the eighteen souls his special mission, and shall send them forth to accomplish their task. We shall instruct them to teach the word of God and to quicken the souls of men. Having spoken these words to me, he dismissed me from his presence. Accompanying me to the door of the house, he committed me to the care of God. This revelation, so suddenly and impetuously thrust upon me, came as a thunderbolt which for a time seemed to have benumbed my faculties. There is a footnote. It is related in the Baharul Anvar, the Avalim, and the Yanbu of Sadiq, son of Muhammad, that he spoke these words. Knowledge is seven and twenty letters. All that the prophets have revealed are two letters thereof. None thus far hath known any besides these two letters. But when the Qaim shall arise, he will cause the remaining five and twenty letters to be made manifest. Consider, he hath declared knowledge to consist of seven and twenty letters, and regarded all the prophets from Adam even unto the seal as expounders of only two letters thereof, and as having been sent down with these two letters. He also saith that the Qaim will reveal all the remaining five and twenty letters. Behold from this utterance how great and lofty is his station. His rank excelleth that of all the prophets, and his revelation transcendeth the comprehension and understanding of all their chosen ones. From the Kitab i Iqan, page 243. I was blinded by its dazzling splendor and overwhelmed by its crushing force. Excitement, joy, awe, and wonder stirred the depths of my soul. Predominant among these emotions was a sense of gladness and strength which seemed to have transfigured me. How feeble and impotent, how dejected and timid I had previously felt. Then I could neither write nor walk, so tremulous were my hands and feet. Now, however, the knowledge of his revelation had galvanized my being. I felt possessed of such courage and power that were the world, all its peoples and potentates to arise against me, I would alone and undaunted withstand their onslaught. The universe seemed but a handful of dust in my grasp. I seemed to be the voice of Gabriel personified, calling unto all mankind, Awake, for lo, the morning light has broken. Arise, for his cause is made manifest. The portal of his grace is open wide. Enter therein, O peoples of the world, for he who is your promised one is come. In such a state, I left his house and joined my brother and nephew. A large number of the followers of Sheikh Ahmad 
who had heard of my arrival, had gathered in the Majid e Ilkhani to meet me. Faithful to the directions of my newly found beloved, I immediately set myself to carry out his wishes. As I began to organize my class and perform my devotions, a vast concourse of people gathered gradually about me. Ecclesiastical dignitaries and officials of the city also came to visit me. They marveled at the spirit which my lectures revealed, unaware that the source whence my knowledge flowed was none other than he whose advent they, for the most part, were eagerly awaiting. During those days I was, on several occasions, summoned by the Bab to visit him. He would send, at night-time, that same Ethiopian servant to the Majid, bearing to me his most loving message of welcome. Every time I visited him, I spent the entire night in his presence. Wakeful until dawn, I sat at his feet, fascinated by the charm of his utterance, and oblivious of the world and its cares and pursuits. How rapidly those precious hours flew by. At daybreak, I reluctantly withdrew from his presence. How eagerly in those days I looked forward to the approach of the evening hour, with what feelings of sadness and regret I beheld the dawning of day. In the course of one of these nightly visits, my host addressed me in these words. Tomorrow, thirteen of your companions will arrive. To each of them extend the utmost loving kindness. Leave them not to themselves, for they have dedicated their lives to the quest of their beloved. Pray to God that he may graciously enable them to walk securely in that path which is finer than a hair and keener than a sword. Certain ones among them will be accounted in the sight of God as his chosen and favoured disciples. As to others, they will tread the middle way. The fate of the rest will remain undeclared until the hour and all that is hidden shall be made manifest. There is a footnote. Understand in the same way the beginning of the manifestation of the Bayan. During forty days, no one but the letter Sin believed in B. It was only little by little that the Bismi Lahul Amnaul Akdas clothed themselves with the garment of faith until finally the primal unity was completed. Witness, witness then how it has increased until our day. The Persian Bayan, Volume 4, page 119. That same morning at sunrise, Soon after my return from the home of the Bab, Mullah Ali e Bastami, accompanied by the same number of companions as indicated to me, arrived at the Majid e Ilkhani. I immediately set about to find the means for their comfort. One night, a few days after their arrival, Mullah Ali, as the spokesman of his companions, gave vent to feelings which he could no longer repress. You know well, he said, how great is our confidence in you. We bear you such loyalty that if you should claim to be the promised Qayyim, we would all unhesitatingly submit. Obedient to your summons, we have forsaken our homes and have gone forth in search of our promised beloved. You were the first to set us all this noble example. We have followed in your footsteps. We have determined not to relax in our efforts until we find the object of our quest. We have followed you to this place, ready to acknowledge whomsoever you accept, in the hope of seeking the shelter of his protection and of passing successfully through the tumult and agitation that must needs signalize the last hour. How is it that we now see you teaching the people and conducting their prayers and devotions with the utmost tranquility? Those evidences of agitation and expectancy seem to have vanished from your countenance. Tell us, we beseech you, the reason that we too may be delivered from our present state of suspense and doubt. Your companions, I gently observed, they naturally attribute my peace and composure to the ascendancy which I seem to have acquired in this city. The truth is far from that. The world, I assure you, with all its pomp and seductions, can never lure away this Hussein of Bushrui from his beloved. Ever since the beginning of this holy enterprise upon which I have embarked, I have vowed to seal with my life blood my own destiny. For his sake I have welcomed immersion in an ocean of tribulation. I yearn not for the things of this world. I crave only the good pleasure of my beloved. Not until I shed my blood for his name 
or the fire that glows within me be quenched. Please, God, you may live to witness that day. Might not your companions have thought that, because of the intensity of his longing and the constancy of his endeavours, God has, in his infinite mercy, graciously deigned to unlock before the face of Mullah Hussein the gate of his grace, and wishing, according to his inscrutable wisdom, to conceal this fact, has bidden him engage in such pursuits? These words stir the soul of Mullah Ali. He at once perceived their meaning. With tearful eyes he entreated me to disclose the identity of him who had turned my agitation into peace and converted my anxiety into certitude. I adjure you, he pleaded, to bestow upon me a portion of that holy draught which the hand of mercy has given you to drink, for it will assuredly allay my thirst and ease the pain of longing in my heart. Beseech me not, I replied, to grant you this favour. Let your trust be in him, for he will surely guide your steps and appease the tumult of your heart. Mullah Ali hastened to his companions and acquainted them with the nature of his conversation with Mullah Hussein. Ablaze with a fire which the account of that conversation had kindled in their hearts, they immediately dispersed, and seeking the seclusion of their cells, besought through fasting and prayer the early removal of the veil that intervened between them and the recognition of their beloved. They prayed while keeping their vigils, O God, our God, thee only do we worship, and to thee do we cry for help. Guide us, we beseech thee, on the straight path, O Lord, our God. Fulfill what thou hast promised unto us by thine apostles, and put us not to shame on the day of resurrection. Verily, thou wilt not break thy promise. On the third night of his retirement, whilst wrapped in prayer, Mullah Ali i Bastami had a vision. There appeared before his eyes a light, and lo, that light moved off before him. Allured by its splendour, he followed it, till at last it led him to his promised beloved. At that very hour, in the mid-watches of the night, he arose, and exultant with joy, and radiant with gladness, opened the door of his chamber and hastened to Mullah Hussein. He threw himself into the arms of his revered companion. Mullah Hussein most lovingly embraced him and said, Praise be to God who hath guided us hither. We had not been guided had not God guided us. That very morning at break of day, Mullah Hussein, followed by Mullah Ali, hastened to the residence of the Bab. At the entrance of his house, they met the faithful Ethiopian servant who immediately recognized him and greeted them in these words, Ere break of day, I was summoned to the presence of my master, who instructed me to open the door of the house and to stand expectant at its threshold. Two guests, he said, are to arrive early this morning. Extend to them in my name a warm welcome. Say to them from me, Enter therein in the name of God. The first meeting of Mullah Ali with the Bab, which was analogous to the meeting with Mullah Hussein, differed only in this respect, that whereas at the previous meeting the proofs and testimonies of the Bab's mission had been critically scrutinized and expounded, at this one all argument had been set aside, and nothing but the spirit of intense adoration and of close and ardent fellowship prevailed. The entire chamber seemed to have been vitalized by that celestial potency which emanated from his inspired utterance. Everything in that room seemed to be vibrating with this testimony. Verily, verily, the dawn of a new day has broken. The promised one is enthroned in the hearts of men. In his hand he holds the mystic cup, the chalice of immortality. Blessed are they who drink therefrom. Each of the twelve companions of Mullah Ali, in his turn, by his own unaided efforts, sought and found his beloved. Some in sleep, others in waking, a few whilst in prayer, and still others in their moments of contemplation experienced the light of this divine revelation and were led to recognize the power of its glory. After the manner of Mullah Ali, these and a few others, accompanied by Mullah Hussein, attained the presence of the Bab and were declared letters of the living. Seventeen letters were gradually enrolled in the preserved tablet of God and were appointed as the chosen apostles of the Bab, the ministers of his faith, 
and the diffusers of his light. One night, in the course of his conversation with Mullah Hussein, the Bab spoke these words. Seventeen letters have thus far enlisted under the standard of the faith of God. There remains one more to complete the number. These letters of the living shall arise to proclaim my cause and to establish my faith. Tomorrow night, the remaining letter will arrive and will complete the number of my chosen disciples. The next day, in the evening hour, as the Bab, followed by Mullah Hussein, was returning to his home, there appeared a youth dishevelled and travel-stained. He approached Mullah Hussein, embraced him, and asked him whether he had attained his goal. Mullah Hussein tried at first to calm his agitation and advised him to rest for the moment, promising that he would subsequently enlighten him. That youth, however, refused to heed his advice. Fixing his gaze upon the Bab, he said to Mullah Hussein, I seek you to hide him from me. I can recognize him by his gait. I confidently testify that none besides him, whether in the East or in the West, can claim to be the truth. None other can manifest the power and majesty that radiate from his holy person. Mullah Hussein marveled at his words. He pleaded to be excused, however, and induced him to restrain his feelings until such time as he would be able to acquaint him with the truth. Leaving him, he hastened to join the Bab and informed him of his conversation with that youth. Marvel not, observed the Bab, at his strange behaviour. We have in the world of the spirit been communing with that youth. We know him already. We indeed awaited his coming. Go to him and summon him forthwith to our presence. Mul Hussein was instantly reminded by these words of the Bab of the following traditional utterance. On the last day, the men of the unseen shall on the wings of the spirit, traverse the immensity of the earth, shall attain the presence of the promised Chaim, and shall seek from him the secret that will resolve their problems and remove their perplexities. Though distant in body, these heroic souls are engaged in daily communion with their beloved, partake of the bounty of his utterance, and share the supreme privilege of his companionship. Otherwise, how could Sheikh Ahmad and Seed Qazim have known of the Bab? How could they have perceived the significance of the secret which lay hidden in him? How could the Bab himself, how could Qudus, his beloved disciple, have written in such terms, had not the mystic bond of the Spirit linked their souls together? Did not the Bab, in the earliest days of his mission, allude in the opening passages of the Kayumul Azma, his commentary on the Suri of Joseph, to the glory and significance of the revelation of Baha'u'llah? Was it not his purpose? by dwelling upon the ingratitude and malice which characterized the treatment of Joseph by his brethren, to predict what Baha'u'llah was destined to suffer at the hands of his brother and kindred. Was not Qudus, although besieged within the fort of Sheikh Tabasi by the battalions and fire of a relentless enemy, engaged both in the daytime and in the night season in the contemplation of his eulogy of Baha'u'llah, that immortal commentary on the Sad of Samad, which had already assumed the dimensions of 500,000 verses. Every verse of the Qayyumul Asma, every word of the aforementioned commentary of Qudus, will, if dispassionately examined, bear eloquent testimony to this truth. The acceptance by Qudus of the truth of the Ba'a's revelation completed the assigned number of his chosen disciples. Qudus, whose name was Muhammad Ali, was, through his mother, a direct descendant of the Imam Hassan, the grandson of the Prophet Muhammad. He was born in Bafurush, the province of Mazindaran. It has been reported by those who attended the lectures of Sir Qazim that in the last years of the latter's life, Qudus enrolled himself as one of the Seed's disciples. He was the last to arrive and invariably occupied the lowliest seat in the assembly. He was the first to depart upon the conclusion of every meeting. The silence he observed and the modesty of his behaviour distinguished him from the rest of his companions. Seed Qazim was often heard to remark that certain ones among his disciples, though they occupied the lowliest of seats and observed the strictest silence, were nonetheless so exalted in the sight of God that he himself felt unworthy to rank among their servants. His disciples, although they observed the humility of Qudus and acknowledged the exemplary character of his behaviour, 
remained unaware of the purpose of Seed Kazim. When Kurus arrived in Shiraz and embraced the faith declared by the Bab, he was only twenty-two years of age. Though young in years, he showed that indomitable courage and faith which none among the disciples of his master could exceed.